All right, welcome to the May webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Jamie Foster to our webinar, who will tell us a little bit of the story about the early Earth. But first, here's Dave Prosper with an activity that you can use to engage your audience in helping tell the story. Dave? All right, so this is one of my uh, favorite items from the Night Sky Network, which is the Earth Timeline. You may, have, you may already have this in your club. You may have seen it. It's also part of the whole um, Watery Worlds uh, banner. We're focusing, again, on the Earth timeline. Earth timeline. And um, it's rather large, but it's roughly about the size of the outstretched hands, which I'll get to in a second. Um, it's a very fun demo. You can set this up. It's great for the daytime, especially. Um, this actually you can fold the bottom up and which kind of had it lists when different life forms have popped up um, you fold this up and you ask your participants to sort of uh, guess um, when which kind of kinds of life have evolved on the earth and we have a little sheet where you can cut out uh, different sort of uh, biological events types of creatures when they appeared and to kind of stick them up along the banner when everyone's kind of figured out where things sh they think should be you can then flip it open and kind of show the results there's always a surprise for almost everyone um, and the timeline is of course an approximation of what we um, understand at this time uh, various discoveries may change specifics around a little bit kind of especially near the earliest section of the timeline as we might hear more about tonight and you may notice on the timeline that there's a silhouette of a person with their hands outstretched. It's sort of the basis of how uh, we developed it, how we kind of started. And um, so you can actually uh, do the timeline uh, with your arms if you want, just as a quick sort of like a, like Carl Sagan and the Cosmos sort of doing that sort of demo. Um, and it, just remember that it ends with, um, Filing your nails will, uh, on this scale, erases all of a recorded human civilization. That's always the fun part. And I'll post a link to this in the chat as well. And uh, that's it. And back to you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Dave. Well, now for our featured speaker, Dr. Jamie Foster is an associate professor at the University of Florida. And her research program is dedicated to examining the interactions between microbial communities and their surrounding environments. Whether it's stromatolites or squid, Jamie's working to improve our understanding of the molecular mechanisms that microbes use to adapt and respond to changes in the environment. Please welcome Jamie Foster. Thank you, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here, and I really appreciate you all taking an hour out of your time, your very busy days, uh, to come listen to all things stromatolite tonight. I'm going to start sharing my screen and showing you the slides, and hopefully, start that process. And you can that looks pretty good. And for uh, those of you out there, if it uh, looks a little bit small, up at the top of the screen, you can change uh, um, your viewing properties to make that a little bit bigger. So looks good. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, great. So again, thank you all and thank you, Brian. Thank you, David, for inviting me here today. So stromatolites. So it sounds like a lot of you already know what those are, especially with that uh, timeline that might be going around to your different organizations. Stromatolites are essentially um, living rocks, living ecosystems that, that from this picture here, you see a, a this is a picture that hangs in the Smithsonian. It's an artwork done to represent the, the ancient earth. And what I'm gonna tell you a little bit of is about how they form, where do they occur, why do we care so much about stromatolites, and why do we call them windows into the ancient earth? And if anyone is interested in learning more or has questions that didn't get quite answered um, in tonight's uh, webinar, feel free to email me. My email is at the bottom of this uh, slide here presentation. And you can always Google uh, Jay Foster, um, University of Florida, and uh, my information should come pop right up. So let's talk about first, what is, oops, sorry. 
thought it would move it on itself. Okay, so what is a stromatolite? And essentially what we're talking about are, the stromatolite is actually the minerals left behind by the activities of microbes. So stromatolites are actually made by microbes and their interactions with the environment. Life is always affecting the environment and in return the environment is affecting the life on the planet. And this give and take, this feedback system has really changed the face of the planet and stromatolites have played a role in that. And so here you can see in this photo here, these are living stromatolites from Australia. They're found in a place called Shark Bay or specifically Hamlin Pool. And here's a cross section of a stromatolite and you see lots and lots of layers that are being formed. And so the microbes that have been forming these structures, just lay, each one of these layers used to be the surface community. Um, and as they grew, uh, as the microbes, here's a picture of some of those microbes here, such as cyanobacteria, as they grow towards the sun, uh, they leave behind this structure, this mineral structure. And here's just a, this is a confocal microscope image of some of the sand grains. This is from, taken from the Bahamas, actually, and some of these microbes that are trapping and binding and grabbing on to the sand grains and to the sediment that's coming into their environment. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how they form, but they, they form these matrix and as they grow towards the sun, they leave behind this mineral through a process called biologically induced mineralization. So this is a process by which carbon is basically scrubbed out of their environment and turned into calcium carbonate. And through this process, they've really had a big impact on the planet. And so carbonate mineralization is done in a lot of different ways. Stromatolites aren't the only things that can precipitate carbonate. Obviously, we see shells, seashells on the shore, and they are uh, this process of sequestering or scrubbing out that CO2 and precipitating it as calcium carbonate is a that is a incredibly key part of the global carbon cycle. And so this biologically induced um, mineralization that requires life, you have to have life, but it's not active. It's not like a shell precipitation or a skeleton precipitation. It's a little different. It's where you're taking and you're manipulating the environment around you. The microbes living in the stromatolite are changing their microenvironment around them and forming all these very unique structures. And the type of structure is dependent on what microbe is there, what sugar is there, and, and so forth. And each, again, each of these layers represented a, a past surface community. And it's like a, a timeline going into the past. And then sometimes you don't, you can get precipitation without, without life present. But, but this is the one that stromatolites uh, use. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of the presentation. So again, what is a stromatolite? These are layers of, of past communities and they're representing the past um, surface of that environment. And it's like a tree ring. If you cut into a tree ring, each ring of the tree is representing um, a, you know, a, a hint or a history of what that tree went through over its history. And the stromatolites can do the same thing. Each layer is almost like a footprint looking back um, into the biosignatures or in biomarkers or what was happening to that particular ecosystem at that moment in time. And again, we've talked about the microbes that live on the surface that make these structures, and we call those communities microbial mats. And microbial mats, they're found all over the place, all over the world in, in the modern earth. Not all of them make stromatolites, only a few locations in the world, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But microbial mats are essentially organized communities of microbes that form these very distinct layers and here's a picture of one taken from a salt pond it looks a little different it's no, there's no mineralization in this particular example but they have complex cycling of nutrients. They're, they're cycling carbon, they're cycling oxygen and sulfur through a whole host of different metabolisms here. And this is all happening within a very small region. Um, centimeters and all of these different metabolisms are working together to influence their environment. Specifically, they can influence the pH of their environment and, and shift things either towards something more acidic or shift things towards 
um, something more alkalinic. And it takes a shift towards higher pH or a more alkaline environment in order to facilitate actual stromatolites to form. So they need a slightly higher pH um, and they don't form well under acidic conditions. So what's the big deal? So why should we, any of us, care about stromatolites? I told you this, they were very abundant in the past here, but, and here's just a picture of a modern example, but why should we care? And uh, one of the key organisms that make stromatolites that we'll talk a lot talk about a lot more are cyanobacteria. And here's another confocal image showing all sorts of different types of microbes living in that environment, predominantly cyanobacteria. And stromatolites are, are important, especially if we want to understand the history of the earth, because they're the oldest known ecosystem on the planet that we know about. And uh, we'll talk about their age, but the modern systems, by studying living examples, hopefully we can understand the processes that happened in the past. Now the microbes are no longer the same. They've changed through evolution. The microbes in the, in the living examples today are probably not anything like the microbes uh, in the past in terms of their genetic structure and what genes they might have. But the metabolisms that they do are probably ancient. And we can learn a lot about how the living systems function, work together, communicate amongst themselves to understand how things might have originated or evolved in the past. So understanding the living systems gives us a lot of information. Um, they serve as analogs to the past. Another important reason is these guys are little CO2 scrubbers. They are pulling CO2 out of the environment and turning it into calcium carbonate. They're scrubbing out that CO2. So by understanding those processes and what are the environmental um, parameters, so to speak, what's the envelope of the maximum amount of precipitation that can happen, that could also be very important to understand insights and in how our, our Earth is changing today and, and what are the effects of maybe anthropogenic uh, climate change and how will that affect these stromatolite reef systems. Um, and also, these things are dominated by cyanobacteria, which are tolerant to all sorts of environmental stress. And we can learn a lot about how they're dealing with DNA repair, UV stress, and they can give us a lot of insights in how they communicate with other microbes within these systems. So all these things together uh, make them very insightful ecosystems to look at to understand how did life come to be on the planet. Now, how old are the oldest stromatolites? This is a bit controversial. Some people push it back to 3.7. Some people you know, say nothing younger than 3.3 or 3.4 billion years ago. And I tend to use the geological term giga annum, GA, in terms to represent uh, time. So you'll see that on the future slides, just 3.5 GA or billion years or 3,500 million years. So that's kind of my safe number that I kind of throw out there of where stromatolites uh, that are the least amount, you know, fossil representatives that are uh, less controversial. But there are some people that put that back, push that back to about 3.7 billion years ago. Now that's a really long time. Here on this cartoon here, we can just see this is the modern um, eon, uh, eon, the Phanerozoic here. And all of that on the right-hand column here fits into this upper left-hand portion here. Um, and that's like all all the dinosaurs, land plants, uh, the rise of animals, all of that happened around here. Um, the Precambrian is everything else. And stromatolites came very early on in Earth's history. And uh, they first formed in the Archean. And we, the boundary between the Hadean, or the formation of the Earth, and then the first uh, origins of life kind of marks that boundary between the Hadean and the Archean, roughly uh, three and a half, three point seven billion years ago. And these are just some times, some guidelines, give or take a few hundred million years. But this pre Precambrian period was the when stromatolites ruled the Earth, and they make up about ninety percent of Earth's history that Precambrian period. So what, what was the Ar Archean Eon like? What, when stromatolites formed, what did the Earth look like? Well, the big thing that was different, well, two big things. First, as you can see here in this little cartoon, there weren't the continents that we think of today. There would have, uh, this is the time when maybe some of the continents, the oceanic crust might have been oozing out, the continents are starting to form. But life probably originated very early when there might have just been 
uh, just these fledgling formations. Um, and the, the other big factor, what the Archean was like, is there would have not been free oxygen in the, in the environment. It would have been um, probably enriched in CO2 and methane and probably some more hydrogen than there is now. And another thing that was very different was the sun was less luminous. There's this thing called the faint young sun hypothesis. As the sun, um, as the sun is aging, it is getting brighter. And so the, the earth was probably, uh, the sun was less luminous in the past. So the earth uh, probably relied more on greenhouse gases to keep, it, uh, to keep it warm and to keep it from just freezing over. But by the end of the Archean, uh, we have a very few remnants. These are called cratons. These are these remnants of the ancient continents that still exist that uh, geologists study today. And uh, right around this, so this is what uh, would have, what has survived uh, from the Archean on the modern Earth. And these plate tectonics would have been very critical for nutrients to be cycling and moving around. So you probably would have had plate tectonics by the end of the Archean. So the Earth looked very different from its atmosphere, the lack of continents, uh, or pronounced continents as we think of today. And uh, you would have had to have, there would have been a lot more greenhouse gases in the environment. But the oldest stromatolite fossils date back from this time. And this is just a picture of some from Australia. And you can kind of see those layers. And I know it kind of can look like, why, how do we know that this is a stromatolite? And hence why there's a lot of controversy dating back to these. But there are actually micro in a lot of these old, and some of them are, are people propose that these are in fact cyanobacteria. And this particular region in Western Australia is very close to the region that I work on today. This is where the living ones uh, are today. And here's an example of a region where they were fossilized uh, examples lived. So they're very old and we have very good fossil um, record of them dating back to roughly three and a half billion years. And I want to talk a little more about the cyanobacteria because these are so important to the, the, the change that, or the impact that stromatolites have had on the planet. So cyanobacteria, just as a refresher, are what we call photoautotrophic bacteria. That means that the photo part means of where they're getting their energy from. That means they're getting energy from the sun through photosynthesis. And the auto part, that tells you where the carbon is coming from. And these guys are getting their carbon from fixing atmospheric CO2. They're just metabolizing it um, directly from the environment. And here's just kind of a, a cartoon drawing of what a average cyanobacteria uh, looks like. Cyanobacteria still have a dramatic impact on the planet today. I live in Florida and we are dealing with um, uh, a very uh, bad cyanobacterial problem in some of our water areas. A uh, big bad bloom happened in 2016. But they're also being targeted for biofuels, um, spirulina supplements. I have arthritis. I take these. Um, and so their cyanobacteria still play a valuable role. But in the past, they had a pivotal role in changing the face of the planet. So cyanobacteria dominate stromatolites, but the key metabolism that occurs that they do is photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis. And so the primary source of the free oxygen that you're, so if you take a breath right now, breathe in, you have bacteria to thank you for that particular oxygen molecule. Most people think plants, but it really is both cyanobacteria and algae in the oceans that are making most of the oxygen on the planet. But free oxygen can't exist very long. It's not, um, it, it's so reactive that it can't hang out for very long. So there has to be a constant resupply of oxygen in the atmosphere. And it is so reactive that there has to be a re regular replenishment. Um, if photosynthesis stopped today, if we just stopped, you know, blocked out the sun and all photosynthesis stopped, basically oxygen would be scrubbed out of our atmosphere in about 2 million years. So I like to call it the best atmospheric biomarker. As we search now for exoplanets beyond Earth, I would bet my house, uh, there's a webinar, so there's proof of this, that if we found an exoplanet with an with a oxygen atmosphere of 10, 15, 20%, I would bet you my house that there's, a, there's life generating that oxygen. But, and hopefully someone will challenge me on that and find that exoplanet. Um, and so cyanobacteria 
are that rise in oxygen completely changed the face of, of the planet. So here's just the, a kind of a cartoon. I call it rust and no rust, but basically all that oxygen started to accumulate. If you look at the rock record prior to around 2.4 billion years ago, there's no, uh, there's no iron oxide in the rocks. There's no of this quote unquote rust. Um, but right around 2.4 billion years ago, all of a sudden you start to see an accumulation of iron oxide in the rock record. We call these, the, the, the patterns, this banded iron uh, formation, this is kind of patterns of, of, of iron oxide, no iron oxide, iron oxide. It's kind of this, this um, layered uh, rock, where a lot, layered rock face here. And uh, you can get it, by looking at this, you can get and dating these rocks. It all kind of dates back to around 2.4 billion years ago. Again, giga annums is 1 billion years. So something, there is a clear rock record of the rise in oxygen right around this time that stromatolites are, are not only uh, appearing, but also um, taking over. But there's a few other things that we have to think about with regards to the rise of oxygen. So here again is the same little cartoon about the rise of oxygen. And roughly here is where you start to see um, carbon fixation and the rise of stromatolites, cyanobacteria, fossils. But you don't really see the rise. It takes a few hundred million years for the, for the accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere. And a couple things are happening there. So what, as I mentioned, Earth um, probably lost a lot of its primary atmosphere and uh, hydrogen that would have been around during the formation of the planet probably escaped to space. Jupiter, Saturn, they've kept their hydrogen atmosphere because they're so big. But Mars, Earth, Venus probably just slowly uh, lost all that hydrogen to space because we just aren't big enough to, to, to keep that uh, hydrogen. So as the planet is degassing, carbon's accumulating, methane's accumulating, carbon dioxide, excuse me, is accumulating. And so the secondary atmosphere, or maybe tertiary atmosphere, um, is, is slowly building up. But as photosynthesis is emitting um, oxygen into the environment, slowly that oxygen is oxidizing all the rocks that we just saw in those banded iron formations and basically the whole planet. So you can think of the whole planet as like a sponge soaking up all that oxygen. But at some point, you're going to saturate your sponge um, and it's going to start overflowing. And so that oxygen eventually, after it has oxidized the crust, the mantle, that sink or the oxidation of the planet starts to slow down. And that probably took maybe even a billion years for that process where the sources of oxygen out were larger than the sinks. And eventually you start to accumulate um, oxygen into the atmosphere. And we have a lot of evidence to, about the timing of all of this. Again, we have the banded iron formations that tell us that something really dramatic happened to the rock record around 2.4 billion years ago. And we do have biomarkers. These are residuals from microfossils, those cyanobacteria microfossils that I showed you. Uh, sometimes the cells degrade, but a lot of times the, the molecules survive much longer than a, an actual cell membrane. So we have biomarkers and these fossils suggesting that photosynthesis probably happened a lot earlier than this um, change at, at around two and a half billion years ago. So we have uh, bio, biomarkers that go back 2.7 billion years. And we have things like hopanoids. These are molecules only made by photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And we think that this rise in oxygen enabled, um, it, didn't, it, it didn't coincide with the origin of animals, but definitely it facilitated the rise of animals um, and definitely facilitated the rise of, of, of a whole diverse array of eukaryotes and plants and so forth. Um, and, and diversity of animals, I should say, rather than the origin of animals. And we have things like sterian markers, you know, to, to, to kind of get a lot of these timing of when eukaryotes started to appear, all coinciding with, again, these increases in oxygen abundance. So, but that would have caused, a, a, you know, this rise in oxygen around two and a half billion years ago would have been a crisis for life. Um, uh, there's a term coined by Carl Sagan called the oxygen holocaust. And that would have been because oxygen is so reactive, it can interact with organic molecules, um, it can break uh, uh, 
different kinds of bonds and you it would have just started to um, oxidize different molecules um, and so it would have been a major pollution event uh, so the cyanobacteria living in these little stromatolites um, really caused the first major pollution event on the planet and many species anaerobic species probably went extinct and they survived by either going deep into sediments or deep into the oceans. And so stromatolites, through their process, through this, um, the rise of, of photosynthesis and the rise of oxygen, have really impacted the, the face of the planet and, and the evolution of life on Earth uh, because of this metabolism of photosynthesis. Now, there are plenty of other metabolisms in, in stromatolites that are necessary to help form them, and we'll talk a little bit about those later. So let's talk about stromatolite formation. And, and again, to me, to understanding the past, we, we need to study living examples of stromatolites. The microbes might be somewhat different from the ancient ones. Their genomes might be rearranged, but, but a lot of the metabolisms still exist that, uh, that were around for the past three billion years. And so here's just a few pictures of some of the stromatolites I work on and the living examples. And again, you can see some of the ancient uh, structures from the past. So the living stromatolites that are found, there. this graph is, is just showing you a few of the uh, locations around the planet where they still form. I work on two locations. I work in the Bahamas and in Shark Bay. These are two of the best examples of the laminated at the layered stromatolites. There are many other types of what we call microbialites. Those are um, pre precipitation events that are caused by microbes, but they might have that C in the fossil record. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done from these two environments. And the, the Shark Bay location in Western Australia was, was discovered in the 1950s. There was a long time where people thought stromatolites were extinct. And it really wasn't until the 1950s when Phil Playard, Playford and some of his colleagues uh, discovered them. And in 1991, it became a World Heritage Site um, in Western Australia. And then there's another location that's pretty more accessible for us here in the United States to go visit in the Exumas of the Bahamas, where they were more recently discovered in the 1980s. But I'll talk a little bit about some of the work I've done in Shark Bay, Western Australia, uh, specifically the part of Shark Bay called Hamlin Pool. And these, this is, there are millions and millions of living stromatolites today, over 120 that we can, we guesstimate. And it's really the current, the, the planet's most extensive, spectacular living stromatolite system. And uh, there are just so many of them. And you can visit them if you ever make it out to uh, Western Australia. And you can go take a look at, at these for yourself, living ones. So unfortunately, in today's world, stromatolites typically live in more extreme environments. And that, we think, is mainly because of the activities of eukaryotes. These are tasty morsels that fish and other organisms like to eat. And so that for, for a stromatolite ecosystem to really thrive, they tend to be in very extreme environments. And Shark Bay is, is an extreme environment. It's very hot there, it's very sunny. Sometimes these stromatolites are spending half their day out of the water, so they have to deal with UV stress, desiccation, um, high salinity. Uh, Shark Bay is roughly anywhere from two to three, or Hamlin Pool, I should say, is roughly two to three times the salinity. And for us working in that environment, there can also be too many snakes. Uh, it's an extreme environment for us too, because uh, there's the dreaded sea snake here that if it bites you, you're dead, because there's only like one dose of anti-venom in the entire state of Western Australia. So it's an extreme environment for all participants. But how do we go about taking this gamish of microbes? How do they organize themselves and how do they actually form these amazing, interesting, intricate structures? And for me to do that, this is what I work on, is I want to know about the microbiome of, this in, of these communities and also what's happening in their environment. Again, this give and take between life and the environment. So how do I go about studying these stromatolites? 
Well, first, when it comes to the environment, we have set up data loggers. Uh, we've gotten permission from the Australian government, and we've set up data loggers that have been going nonstop since about 2012. And we're constantly measuring changes in temperature, salinity, and the wave energy that's happening, the water flow energy, all throughout at all these different locations in the pool. And we kind of just uh, snooba here and um, put stakes into the ground and then we can just uh, have these uh, data loggers that we go periodically check on them. Um, and so we have always have a constant source of what's happening into the environment. Another more recent activity that we've been doing is we've been working with um, uh, Vaith Chirai um, at NASA Ames uh, using drones to start making more highly detailed maps of the stromatolite, the floor of Hamlin Pool, and trying to get an understand, uh, standing of what type of stromatolites are where and um, how abundant they are. And these maps can really be important guides to understanding where do we want to go and explore and help us um, put together some of these um, ideas of, of the morphology of some of these stromatolites and how the environment might be changing that. And drone technology is a wonderful technology that I assume we will definitely be using to explore other worlds. Uh, they might not be stromatolites on Titan, but I'm sure the drone technologies will help explore some of the, the many um, methane or ethane lakes on the surface and other uh, potential areas on other worlds. So, but I primarily focus more on the microbiome aspect, the microbiology. And to me, the microbiome is not only the microbes that are present in these ecosystems, but also the metabolism. What are they doing? What is their metabolic potential in these sites? And also not only what microbes and what are their activities, but how are they interfacing with the environment? How are they actually precipitating um, that those carbonate molecules. So all three of these, I call it the three M's here, the microbes, metabolisms, and minerals, to me make up the microbiome. And maybe some of you have heard about the microbiome of humans and how microbes are, are so important to, to human health. And we're using many of the same tools that we use to study the human microbiome as the stromatolite microbiome. And we call it omics, omics technology. There's genome, metagenomics, um, metatranscriptomics, all these little omics tools, it's our jargon for the molecular biologists, um, to, to study and look at the molecular fingerprints. What are those microbes actually doing? What are their genomes and what's happening? How are they communicating and talking to each other? And we can do metaomics for looking at the DNA, the metabolites, the proteins, and we can look holistically at all of them together to see what are, what are the patterns that we can, within all these molecular signals. And like Lego blocks, we can put, try to reconstruct and put them together to understand what were the sequences of DNA, what were the, the different proteins that these are using to communicate and form. So I kind of use these molecular toolkits. And as I mentioned, it, we're doing an approach very similar to the Human Microbiome Project, understanding who's in the community, what's the microbial diversity of that community, what, is, what are their activities, what are they doing in that environment. And to the, do this, we use what, are, what is called metagenomics. We sequence the DNA of everything in the entire uh, stromatolite ecosystem. And then we look at something called RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, and that is actually what is being expressed. That's what they're actually doing it and when they're doing it. And we call that technique. That omic is called transcriptomics. Um, and so we can put all of these together to start building a, a family tree or a, a map. Here's a, a really good example of what we're trying to do here. This is an example of the human, a map of the human microbiome, but we're doing the same techniques and the same, using the same tools uh, for this project. So for what we actually do for the who, what, when, and where, what we're looking at is there's a very common molecule called a, a it's a small subunit ribosomal RNA molecule. Okay, what the heck is that? So every organism on the planet makes, um, well, with the exception of viruses, but every bacterium, every eukaryotic cell, every archaean, all have um, ribosomes. And these are the protein powerhouses of a cell. And there's a small little piece of RNA molecule that is the back 
backbone of your ribosome. And it, it's, it's essential. It is absolutely critical to, to in order for a cell to make proteins is to have this rRNA molecule. And so it's very conserved and we can um, use that molecule to make family trees of all the microbes living in that. So we can look at the relationships of who is in the community. And then we do a step further, not just looking at one gene, but we look at all the genes. And we're now getting, it's so cheap to sequence a genome. I can sequence a, a bacterial genome in about two hours in my lab now. And we can now start to sequence all the microbes within these communities and see how they're changing to their environment, how they're changing their chemistry. And then we can take a step further and start sequencing the RNA of the molecules to see, um, okay, they have all these potential genes. How are they actually using them? And so the big take home messages of all these molecular tools is our three messages that I'm going to finish with um, for this talk. First is that microbes make protective molecules and, and we'll talk a little bit about what those molecules are and why that's so important for stromatolite formation. Then we'll talk a little bit about how microbes are, are they're never found uh, or they're rarely found alone in nature. And so we'll talk about how those community structures uh, are essential for stromatolite formation. And the other big thing, what, you know, so it's not just photosynthesis, there's other metabolisms and the waste of one is food for the other. And we can learn a lot about these kinds of lessons um, that applies to ecology all across the board, not just stromatolites. So these are the three that my molecular toolkit, these are the three messages that I'm going to follow up on and finish with. So microbial, the microbes in these mats, they're making protective molecules. That's protecting them from the UV radiation. That's serving as the glue that's holding these stromatolites together. So here are just some sand grains I had in the lab, and then I added some microbes from a stromatolite. And in a month, uh, they start to fuse all of those uh, sand grains together. And we call that, those, um, that material, that matrix, exopolymeric substances. It's the glue that's basically keeping those microbes together in that environment. For a hang on, if you've got a wave coming and crashing on top of you and potentially the tide taking you out, if you don't hang on to your environment, you are lost from that ecosystem. So it is so incredibly important for you to hang on, stay in your community, stay in your stromatolite, and, and create these, these matrices, these biofilms, in order for you to, to hang on into the stromatolite. And they also serve as food. It is sugar. And so, again, the food of one is, is the waste of another product. These guys are making these sugars and helping feed their, their, their neighbors. And in return, their neighbors are making molecules that they can use for their own metabolisms. So they, again, these protective molecules, how they function in stromatolite formation is, so you have all this gooey material, all this sugar material, and it is literally, all the green here in this little picture here um, is that glue, is that EPS, that sugar material. And the microbes are, the cyanobacteria in this case, here's a, a, a light microscope uh, image and here's a confocal image. They're trapping, they're binding, they're adhering to these sand grains and producing all this uh, EPS material. And this EPS material, the sugar, is actually the nucleus of where the mineralization happens. So it's happening outside the cell. And here's just a, a picture. This is what we call a thin section of the stromatolite. And here's one of those layers being actively formed of how the, the, the carbon, the calcium carbonate is starting to form. And here's just a, kind of a, a little image here taken from this uh, cross section of the stromatolite. And wherever you see these blue lines, that's a layer that was formed um, inside that EPS material. And then again, that lithifies and hardens and the microbes uh, living in here, they just move ever, ever closer to the sun. And so again, that's how we form these lamination. And again, each, la each layer used to be a form of surface mat uh, where that trapping and binding and all that EPS material was happening. So again, it takes a community. We just talked about that 16S RNA gene, how it's found in all uh, organisms. In bacteria and archaea, they have what's called the 16S RNA. Uh, uh, eukaryotes, we have what's called an 18S. So we all have to have this essential ribosomal RNA molecule. And we can construct trees, family trees, from that information.
So this is a huge advantage because every living microbe or cell has this on the planet so we can reconstruct um, trees. But if we just work with the DNA, we don't know what's active because the DNA is a genetic blueprint. It's the architecture for the whole cell, but it doesn't tell you what's being expressed or what's being turned on at any given moment. So that's why we also like to work with the RNA. And that is like taking a snapshot, a photograph of the activity of what the cell might actually be doing um, in the cell. And so we can sequence those, those expressed genes, just it can be the 16S or it can be other genes as well. And then you're able to actually see what, what microbes are metabolizing. What are they actually, what we call transcribing? What are they actually making? And so um, when we do that, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go too heavy in the data, but what, we, what you see here is it's not just one cyanobacterium or two cyanobacteriums. It is a very diverse community of cyanobacteria and other microbes present within these communities. And we can create spatial profiles. We can, we can use our molecular tools and, and with a scalpel kind of literally uh, reconstruct the microbial organization, the spatial organization happening within these microbial mats and look even further of who might be the most important cyanobacteria in that community, who's metabolizing the most. In this case, it's, it's a relative of this guy called Seneca caucus because these are circles have to do with relative abundance. But what I wanted to show you is that we can use these toolkits to look at the activity of the different microbes within the stromatolite and reconstruct their metabolisms over time. And when we do that, basically what we can do is reconstruct, yes, photosynthesis is a major metabolism, but it also takes other metabolisms like nitrogen fixation, um, anoxygenic photosynthesis, uh, sulfate reduction, uh, denitrification, all of these different metabolisms happen. And by looking at when they're expressed, we can see whether they're happening during the day or when they're happening at night. And some of these metabolisms like photosynthesis help increase the pH and that helps promote per carbonate precipitation, therefore promoting stromatolite formation. Whereas some metabolisms are actually being enriched um, at night and some metabolisms, if the arrow is pointing this direction, that decreases the pH. So there's a constant pendulum that's happening in these environments, going oscillating between high pH and low pH. And it's the net um, productivity of these communities that determines whether or not you, you get precipitation or not. Not all, like I said, microbial mats make stromatolites, so it has to be um, a part of the environment is having a very big part. So let's put all of these ideas together. Again, stromatolites are so important to help us understand how life and the environment co-evolved. How does all of this microbiome and how does all this environmental, all our data loggers and all our environmental conditions, how do they fit together? And um, so all of these environmental conditions are feedbacking with the microbes in the community. What does community composition mean for the environment? What does the metabolisms mean? They're creating microenvironments and they're changing the environment, which then um, might impact how many microbes could actually colonize on the surface and form mineral productions. So all of this give and take, um, the microbial the environment is maybe creating substrate that mineral structures can, can attach to. Um, and all of this give and take affects the net production of whether a stromatolite forms or disassociates. And so together, this production of stromatolites, we call that the alkalinity engine, these metabolisms that are driving precipitation. And, but that organic matrix is so incredibly important, that glue that's holding everything together, because that can facilitate where the mineralization actually happens. So that's, I've given you a lot of information about the big picture of how stromatolites form, but it's really this give and take between the environment, constantly uh, going back and forth with life. And stromatolites have been around for, as we've seen, hundreds of millions of years. They've seen 400 parts per thousand CO2. They've seen 10,000 parts per thousand CO2. So by understanding how they react to these different environmental conditions will be a very important insight into how maybe other ecosystems or other, other microbial ecosystems are going to adapt to an ever-changing atmosphere and ever-changing earth. 
And there's always speculation that there might be more stromatolites out there. I don't know if they're ever, you know, Europa, Titan, uh, Enceladus is probably too far away for a photosynthetic driven system. Um, but I have seen microbes living in caves as with as low as, uh, with just hints of, of photosynthetic energy making their living through photosynthesis. So I don't so cross anything off. But there have been some people who have hypothesized, this is really just a hypothesis now, that maybe some of the structures they're finding on Mars, they call them microbial induced sedimentary structures on Earth anyway, maybe these could be more morphologies that serve as a remote biosignature. And maybe some, some of the, the images that people have seen on Mars could be stromatolite-like or microbialite-like. But this is, uh, I would not, uh, go out on a limb and say these are fossil stromatolites, but uh, I definitely think that the exploration of Mars is probably one of the uh, best places to look elsewhere for stromatolite-like morphologies um, because Mars and Earth had very similar origin stories. So maybe someday Mars Curiosity rover and some of the other uh, Mars 2020 missions might bring back some more smoking gun images to suggest uh, these might actually uh, be stromatolite-like fossils. But I just want to thank um, a lot of people. Uh, this is my, my collaborator, Pam Reed, at University of Miami, who helps me with a lot with the geology and, of course, all my graduate students that do a lot of the microbiology work and uh, NASA for, for supporting me uh, for a lot of this research. So I'm going to open it up for questions. And thank you so much for your attention and, and hanging in there throughout all this molecular stuff. All right. Well, this is really fascinating. And it really truly is an, an integrated science. You have all kinds of uh, different things. There's geology, there's uh, atmospheric science, there's uh, you know, biology, uh, chemistry, you know, a little bit of everything. So well, who, that's could, the who couldn't love stromatolites? Well, it's the epitome. Uh, it's the poster child for me for uh, as astrobiology because it is so integrative and, and inherently multidisciplinary that uh, any, I think we're all astrobiologists uh, in, in some way, but definitely if you work on stromatolites. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got a number of uh, good questions here, and um, and so I apologize. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them uh, in all likelihood, but we'll see if we can combine some of them so that we can get to as many as we can. Um, and, and I do want to open it up. If anyone um, doesn't get their question answered, feel free to email me. Okay, great. I'll actually leave my email. Up here. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so, well, let me start. I ended up here at the at the almost the bottom. So, Barry asks: Are there more or uh, uh, fewer stromatolites today than in the past? Definitely fewer. Um, from the fossil record of what we see and where we see them, uh, basically during that Precambrian, that really long period of time, around five, you know, from the form formation of earliest life to about 500 million years ago, stromatolites were probably a do the dominant type of ecosystem on the planet. So uh, they probably were much, much more abundant than we have today. Okay, so uh, Jay asked, and this is an interesting question, you alluded that there were kind of the, these uh, small layers and uh, using tree rings, we can get an idea of changes in the environment over time without knowing what the time span is involved with this, uh, can you get an idea of changes over, I guess, the life of an individual stomatolite? Yes, you could go in and look at the, you might not be able to get uh, cellular fossils, but you could probably, you can definitely get bio, biochemical fossils going through and seeing what maybe the environment was like. Um, on how, when and how these minerals precipitated. You can also get information, I didn't talk about this at all, but using what's called isotopes, stable isotopes. Um, life tends to prefer carbon-12 over carbon-13. There's an extra neutron, neutron in some carbon molecules, and that ratio between um, carb, the heavier carbon and the lighter carbon gives you a, a, a big hint on the metabolism. Photosynthesis isn't too particular. It will, uh, it tends to use up more of the carbon-13, so those ratios can look different from something that group heter heterotrophically or more, or using chemical energy rather than um, uh, carbon dioxide. So um, 
so you can get use use isotopes to and and within those carbon molecules within those organic molecules to help guide you with what metabolism might have helped create or even maybe what even sugar was present by what microbe uh, in those communities so you can really reconstruct the past um, within these layers so Gordon asked an interesting question and, and it kind of maybe speaks to the, the fact that um, these stromatolites have seen all kinds of concentrations of CO2. And so he wonders if the increasing concentration of CO2 um, somehow is, is helping uh, maybe increase uh, um, stromatolite formation. Well, in some ways he might be right because um, there's what's called uh, a, a, pro, a molecule called rubisco, <laughs> and rubisco is found in all sorts of plants, and they actually have their peak activity roughly around 1,200 uh, car CO2 parts per million. So uh, for um, it is conceivable that this might actually help them uh, produce more and have increase their photosynthetic rates. But after 1,200, it kind of seems to flatten out, and there's no real added value of more CO2 uh, for these ecosystems. But like I said, they've been around, they've seen it all. And, and I would be really interested, one of the projects that I've also been working on is how do you break a stromatolite? Like, can you actually change the pH or change the environment um, to, to inhibit this precipitation? And so that's a, an avenue I've been kind of looking at as well. So that's an interesting question about, you know, you know, maybe you meant it in a, in a different way, but uh, um, it, it kind of made me think, Stan asked the question here, what do stromatolites feel like? Uh, they look kind of like rocks, but they're kind of like, look like mushrooms. Are they hard? Are they soft? You know, you, you said that they're difficult to break, and maybe you meant that in a different way. Oh, I meant break and, and sort of disrupt the process. Oh, okay. How do you stop stromatolite formation? That's what I meant. But to okay. get to that question is they are, you can stand on them. And in fact, in some of these protected sites, we have to protect people from standing on them. Um, and because uh, we, they are, you know, these relics of the past, so to speak. But no, they're pretty tough. Um, you can, you, the, the, the softer part is just that topper up layer. Maybe it's only a centimeter long and underneath it's really hard uh, limestone. Essentially, it's just limestone rocks um, and uh, made by, back, live by bacteria. So you can, they're pretty tough. Uh, they've had to be to survive so many billions of years. And so I guess that brings up, uh, David asks, uh, are, these, uh, are the pools in uh, Australia, are they monitored by on-site scientists, uh, continuous monitoring to make sure that people aren't potentially damaging them? How often do scientists visit them? Is it you know, continuously or seasonally monitored? Well, we're trying to do a, a continuous monitoring. We've gotten permission from the Australian government to put out our data loggers, and we're working with an organization called the Bush Heritage Organization in Australia. As, as, uh, Bush Heritage owns um, a wide range. It's kind of like the Na Nature Conservancy for here in the U.S., and we're working with them because they own um, the, what's uh, the station. It's called Hamlin Station, and it's, we're, we're hoping to build a little research station to, to work there. Um, but there's a, a wide range of, uh, of Australian researchers that work there. So there's quite a few different groups. There's researchers from Woods Hole University of Connecticut, other people who are working on these ecosystems. And we want, to, so for a long time, the Australian government kind of treated it as a maus mausoleum. They just didn't let anyone take any samples and they wanted to protect it at all costs. But Hamlin Pool is at high risk of sea, for sea level rise. And that hypersaline, that unique hypersaline environment um, is threatened by sea level rise and the flooding of regular seawater into that area that could completely bring in eukaryotes and cause the system to, to fall apart. So uh, Australia has become much more open into inviting more researchers to study it. And um, it's kind of unfortunately dependent on how many grants we can get and who will support the work. Um, but we're also looking at them as indicators for heat waves. I don't know if you're aware of heat waves that has devastated the Great Barrier Reef on the other side of Australia and other parts of the world. And so we're looking at them as indicators potentially to understand ecosystem health and so we are working very hard to try to get funding to keep monitoring these systems but right now our data loggers are at least in monitoring the environment um, and hopefully we can keep monitoring the microbes as well and their health 
Okay, this, this I think is related and, and Jeffrey's got a couple of different questions here and I'm going to see if I can, you know, somehow or another combine these. Um, he noted that uh, he, he read that Shark Bay is a perhaps, and this might speak to a, you know, a fluctuating sea rise and you know, the sea level is far different now than it was 10,000 years ago. Um, and so he read that Shark Bay is less than 10,000 years old. Um, and how would the bacterial community find and colonize this? And, and I think that there is a way to relate this because then he also notes that this was the major ancient habitat, um, but it didn't look like with the Archean land masses that there weren't a lot of shallow habitats. So, no, no, no. and actually, you know, with sea level rise, there might be more shallow habitats um, on the edges Florida. of... <laughs> <It could be laughs> could be the new stromatolite preserve, you know. <laughs> uh, so there's what was called the Tethy Sea, you know, a few hundred million years ago, the, there were the pretty much most of North America would have been a shallow sea. So there over time has been a lot of op opportunities for shallow um, uh, areas to form and, and these to live. They can live, um, we find them all the way down to uh, 60 feet, uh, 30 meters, maybe 20, 25 meters. Um, so they can go pretty deep um, and you can get these actively forming, but, but true, most of them are, are, actually most of them are in the intertidal zone. Um, but yes, there probably has been a lot of change, um, but, and opportunity for them to form in the past. So they, there probably were many shallow areas. Like I said, North America was at one point, mostly a shallow sea uh, for a good chunk of time called the Tethy Sea. So uh, Jeremiah, is, um, I, you alluded to a couple, so I think you might have seen these. He's very interested in, in where we could uh, you know, potentially find these, and you had alluded to cave systems and uh, you know, whether or not uh, somebody could just casually come upon uh, a stromatolite or, or maybe even expand that if stromatolites are microbial mats. And so, you know, how common are microbial mats? But, you know, maybe we don't have stromatolites uh, uh, as often, but maybe there's more opportunity to, to see the Absolutely. other community. Absolutely. So um, stromatolite are, are what are called microbialites. So I just focused on stromatolites because they're kind of the poster child for microbialites. But there are many types of microbial mats that make these carbonate structures. They make some look more called others called dendrolites and there's some called laolites and and so they're formed all over the place and actually there's some that don't form carbonate they form silica um, or they're gypsum based um, and that's all through South America in the Chilean um, Bolivia and um, Argentina area there's quite a few so my microbialites are actually quite common in a lot of different places around the planet and we're more keep being discovered all the time. There's some in the Pacific Atolls in Kiribati. There's some in South Africa. Uh, there's some in Pavilion Lake and freshwater ones in Mexico. So um, there's some all over the place, but that beautiful laminated structure, that's a little bit more rare, but microbialites in general are found quite often and microbial mass even more. Microbial mat is just essentially a bacterial biofilm, but it's so thick that you can start to get um, cycling of nutrients and, and these more stratified uh, layers to them. I think I had a jar with one growing in it when I was. Yeah, you probably all have microbial mass somewhere in your fridge. <laughs> Well, let's uh, go with uh, one more question here, and, and uh, we're right at the top of the hour now. And so Diane asks, uh, do stromatolites have a, a direct impact on human health? And, you know, we might even think about, you know, uh, indirect impacts. And, and, and if maybe you want to make some comments about, um, you know, how studying them can help us to understand uh, our ability to, you know, have health as humans. <laughs> So I haven't published this yet, but we started looking at the metabolites that stromatolites use, and more than three quarters of them are unknown metabolites, things that have never been found before. 
So I think that there could be a lot of what we call natural products or natural materials that are being produced by these microbes that could be potentially used. Uh, maybe there's new antibiotics, maybe there's new um, uh, different uh, pigments or sunscreens that could, that could might potentially be used uh, for human health. And also just how microbes talk to each other. What, how are they communicating? What cells, what molecules are they using? Um, uh, and how are they, what are their defense mechanisms? So there is a huge black box associated with stromatolites. We are just totally scratching the surface with our understanding of the, the molecular, the biology associated with these guys. And we call it, as you guys will appreciate this, microbial dark matter. It's not, of course, the astronomy dark matter, but it's all this unknown material. And even in our own genomes, we only know what maybe at most, you know, half of what our genes do. So we have such a, a huge frontier of exploration there, just even here on Earth and with these stromatolites. So I think the stromatolites represent the epitome of the past, understanding the past, the present with climate change, and maybe the future of helping us out of these messes that, uh, and, and helping human health. So I think they're there for the past, present, and the future of, for, for life on Earth. Well, that's a great way to end up with looking at the future here. So thank you so much. That's uh, absolutely wonderful. So thank you for joining us, Jamie. This was a very insightful. Thank you, guys. Thank you again for your time. So all of you, uh, you can uh, find this webinar along with many others on the Next Time Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities, and you can find links to uh, Jamie's website and to her papers there as well. We will also post tonight's presentation on the Next Time Network YouTube channel in the next few days.